I really want this to be a, a quite a, conver a conversation about biosecurity and and what I'm going to be doing today. You'll see that a lot of the discussion today is a lot about trees. I'm a, I'm a forest pathologist, forest entomologist, and I used to work for the Chief Plant Health Officer of Victoria. So this is actually where this work is originally was actually where I started, and obviously and also what I'm continuing on now as a consultant. Um, but what I'm trying, what I would encourage you to do is if you have any local ideas and, and how we do this work and, and you've got questions about how you might implement some of the work that we're talking about today, uh, please put it in the comments and more than happy to discuss them as we go through. So I'll just make sure this works properly again and just share it. Can everyone just confirm that working? Yeah, yeah. good. Yep, yeah, that's good. Yes. Great, thank you. So today it's all about managing biosecurity threats and plant collections and because I'm a forest pathologist it will be probably lent more towards the tree side of things than anything else but I but I'm quite happy to touch on other aspects of um, plant life as well but it really is important to, to work for you guys to understand what that risk is to your your plant community within your gardens so today I'm just going to give you a quick introduction about biosecurity what it is uh, we're going to go through um, some sort of case studies as we go through it about what what recent incursions have happened, uh, potential incursions and incursion, incursion management. And we'll talk about each one of the pests with the scenario. So as we're going through, each one of these pests generally has been already found or has had an emergency response attached to it, or it's one that we've actually got a, na a management plan or national management plan in place for this work. So in each one of them will have a slightly different aspect about how you need to think about your threat. So then we'll go through some senator plantings and how you guys might also want to get involved. And then we'll go wrap it up with some conclusions and, and hopefully you guys have a lot of uh, questions for me as well. Uh, you'll also have, you may hear Peter Symes pop in a few times for, through the talk. He's, he, Peter and I have got a, a long relationship of working with the gardens with him when he used to be in Melbourne. Um, and he might jump in occasionally and give some, some of his uh, thoughts and about how we've dealt with some of these pests in the past. So I guess in the past, Australia has relied really heavily on its geographical isolation to provide a degree of natural protection from exotic threats. But the problem we've got is that rapid transport of imports and, and in Australia have increased dramatically and, and the number of imports to Australia have increased dramatically and it's actually increased dramatically even more, even more through in COVID. And because of that, we've got a real heightened risk of, of quarantine risk. So I don't know if I know more about Victoria than other states, but I do know for a fact that two years ago when, when we did some analysis, we identified there was 1.7 million shipping containers coming to the port of Melbourne. And that's huge. So each one of those shipping containers potentially has something from a, from a tree perspective, a wood product, because most of our, most of our equipment, tr um, trucks, tractors, um, boxes, tiles, all sorts of things all come in wooden packaging. And each, if that wooden package isn't treated in the right way, it potentially could potentially could bring in an exotic insect or pathogen into Australia. So an effective biosecurity strategy, a system and a strategy is essential to minimise the impacts of exotic pest incursions. And this can be pre-border and it can also be post-border or at border. So the three pillars of biosecurity are that they have um, limitations or restrictions on material and products that are coming into Australia. Then we have the second level, which is obviously the, the stuff that everyone sees, which is the border protection at the border when you come in on a plane. And then your third level of protection is the is the work that's done by biosecurity agencies in the state, and also work being done by yourselves and the general public in, in reporting and identifying these pests and pathogens. So bias, as I was just saying, plant biosecurity is really relying on the national and international pest incursion policies, supportive management agencies, and this one, really big one for you guys, vigilant, vigilant staff and, and gardeners trained in pest identification. It's, it's actually interesting that most of our detections in Australia have been done, have been found by general public and people working in gardens. And, and they are the two big ones that we try and encourage and, and, and teach people what to look for because they are the ones that normally report our pests and pathogens before our experts or even our biosecurity agencies find them. And biosecurity, agent, biosecurity garden, biosecurity is, is, is really based on early detection and prevention of the pest introductions and mitigation of the outbreaks if they occur. And we'll go through some of those today. So over the last 20, 25 years, these are just some of the ones that have attacked or have been really effective on, have come into Australia. And you'll see there that back in 1999, a small aphid came in 
uh, that's called Pine Monterey Pine aphid. That was found in Canberra by a scientist uh, at CSIRO. Uh, he was looking at his window and saw a pine tree going yellow. Uh, he went outside and found that it was an exotic insect. And since that insect was found, th three years later, it was found across the whole of Australia. Another example is the pinewood nematode, and we'll go through that a bit later. And that was found in Melbourne and moved, moved quite rapidly through um, Melbourne and in the wider surrounds, but it was eradicated. We had palm fusarium wilt, which was found in Sydney and, and Victoria in Melbourne. It's also been found in, in South Australia. And we have these other ones, which uh, other ones you'll see there, myrtle rust in 2010, sycamore lace bug and giant pine scale. And the latest one, which we'll discuss a bit later, which is really should be on everyone's radar, is polyphagus shot hole borer. So the pine wood nematode is the first one I'll give an example of. So it was actually found in a botanic gardens in Williamstown in 1999. It was found because a vigilant staff actually reported it and saying, we've got a dying pine tree that three weeks ago was bright, was green, and now it's going bright yellow. And so biosecurity officers, a forest biosecurity officer, actually went out to have a look at the tree. And when the samples were taken, the nematode was found at this Bursophagus hunanensis. This is the first time this, path this pathogen or, or nematode was found outside of China. And it's the first time it's been found in a dying tree. So it was something very new to the world and the first time it's been found in this scenario. Nematodes can be introduced through wood and boring insects, and generally nematodes themselves can't move around without a vector. And in this relationship, we actually found another beetle at the same time. So further across, when we started doing the surveys, these surveys were done from the Williamstown Gardens, and we actually did an aerial survey, because what we're finding is that these trees, once infected, were actually dying off within three to four weeks. The number of nematodes per five centimeter squares with over four million. And the tree, what was happening was the tree was actually, the vascular tissue was filling up with uh, resinosis and actually killing the tree off. The, clo the re re reason we think this is where it started is it's pro pro close proximity to the port. And it's also close to proximity to what we call um, AAs, which is a quality assurance pr premises, which is where shipping containers can be opened. And the theory behind this is that a, a container has been opened uh, a bunch of insects have come out of that shipping container, have attracted themselves to uh, the closest pine tree, which in this case would have been the Williamstown Botanical Gardens. And then from there, we actually had this uh, effect where it actually spread across uh, Melbourne. And within a three year period, we were able to find those trees and eradicate them. And what's interesting from that one also is uh, since then, we've actually had another detection of longicorn beetles, which carried the nematode in 2009 and also in 2014. Both of those have been eradicated. Uh, this is the beetle that was also found as part of that first detection, Araparus rusticus. Uh, it's similar to the one that's in New Zealand called Araparus ferus, and which is called a burnt pine longicorn beetle. And they have been known to carry nematodes, but are generally ineffective vectors. When we did this work um, back in 2000, we actually squished over like two or 3,000 insects and found that only a handful of insects actually had the nematode on their back. And this correlated with the number of trees that we thought that we found actually in Melbourne affected. So when we started looking at all the pine trees, we only found 42 trees across Melbourne that actually were infested. And if when these first tree was inf when we first found the first tree in Williamstown, we actually found lots of exit holes from this beetle. And we think that what's happened is those exit holes have come out, spread across Melbourne, and those small number of trees have actually been infested. So in th some ways, we're lucky that the tree, the insect themselves, and the nematode didn't establish. The biggest problem with this insect is that it actually causes structural de deformity to the tree. It makes the tree really, really soft and then the trees fall over within a 12 month period. So some of you guys may have heard about Fusarium wilt. Uh, certainly it's a big thing in Melbourne and, and it's also being found in Sydney where it was first identified. When also in, in Sydney gardens, where in the botanical gardens up there, where it actually wiped out many, many canary island date palms throughout the gardens. And very and when if you go into the Sydney botanical gardens, there's very few Phoenix canary ants back, in, back planted there. In Melbourne, it's actually been found in a number of locations close to Melbourne. In some areas, we've actually done eradication responses, which we've had no reinfection, but there are other areas we're under containment. And then we've also found it lately in a couple of other locations in New South Wales, in sorry, in regional Victoria, but also in uh, South Australia. The big thing about this one is we know that it's been moving around primarily by um, arborist and people movement. Uh, so we've actually had uh, really diligent 
Um, people going around pruning all the fronds off to try and keep them safe. Obviously, the falling fronds with those big spines are a danger and un inadvertently spreading the disease along rows of trees. And we did actually find in the Royal Botanical Gardens in Melbourne as well, and it potentially had been moved in by animals, and mainly birds, and those trees were eradicated. And they were quite a difficult eradication because they're actually on an island and we had to float the uh, the trunks and the branches and everything off the uh, off the area. It was quite a challenging one. Uh, sycamore lace bug. This is a becoming more of a problem across the across the country these days. Originally it was found in Sydney in 2006 and it's also been found in Perth now and also moving down from Victoria into Victoria from northern uh, naturally. So if I don't with the we've actually got in um, Victoria we've got elm leaf beetle and we've been actually monitoring elm leaf beetle from Melbourne through to Sydney and it cross and we've also been monitoring sycamore lace bug moving from Sydney towards Melbourne and they seem to actually cross around the Dubbo area. And so when it came across in Victoria, we were finding it in each one of the gardens or um, parks in each one of the local residences and also within the local council areas. And we actually found in the, in the botanical gardens in, in Wodonga, and then we found it at the following year in Hamil in Wangaratta, Benalla, and then down in Seymour. And we're able to do surveillance in each one of those. And as of last year, we found it in the in botanical gardens or the, the gardens are actually in Swiss Creek, which if anyone knows Victoria is up in the high country. And that's the first time it's been found on or over the t over the border. And something you should be really mindful of in this scenario is that these insects are hitchhiker pests. And so even though it may not fly as far as you would think it would fly, or it's not being carried in, in a, inside the trunks of a tree or in a plant, these actually can either sit on the backs of leaves or it can actually be on people's clothes. The scenario at the moment we actually believe is that each one of the locations through Victoria is actually being carried primarily by people having picnics and through cars. And each one of the times that people drive down the highway, they stop at the next park or next toilet stop and actually dropping off the insects as they go down. So just be mindful that this, this is not something that you, with the high visitation that you would have in your gardens, we don't want to stop people visiting, but also there's a creates a risk to the your, to your gardens. Uh, myrtle rust, I'm hoping that everyone's heard about myrtle rust these days. It's been was originally found in 2010 on central coast of, Victor of New South Wales and has rapidly through spread through into Queensland and now in Victoria and also been found lately in Tasmania and Northern Territory in WA. The big take home message with this um, with myrtle rust is the photograph at the bottom there in the in spectral imagery and I think I can, if I can point to my screen you might be able to see that these little spores are like velcro tabs or like what we call chestnut balls. They grab onto you really strong and they can actually, when you walk against a, a plant which is infected by myrtle rust, you can easily pick it up on your clothes. And the example of that is actually in Botanical Gardens in Melbourne. They actually went to a garden centre to buy some plants for the gardens. The garden, the actual garden centre was by accident was actually infested with the, with the pathogen, but the plant they were buying from the nursery wasn't actually a myrtaceae and it wasn't susceptible but it was the sheer walking around the garden centre and actually picking out the plants they wanted. They had brushed up against the uh, myrtle rust in the in the nursery. And when they got back, they, they were going in and out of their front door into their office. And when they got back, and a couple of weeks later, they gave me a call and said, we've got this, we believe this myrtle rust on our gar in our gardens. I said, where is it? And th what it was is the first tree outside their front door of their office was an agonis, which is a highly susceptible species. So when they've gone to the nursery or garden centre, which was infested, we found we were able to do the trace backs, is that they've actually walked in, dropped off the plant at the front door, walked in and out of the out of the front door and actually dropped off the myrtle rust onto that plant at that at that location. So and this actually had happened multiple times at different locations, unfortunately, where we've actually noticed people moving it around inadvertently. Uh, giant pine scale is something that's happened in Victoria lately um, and also in Adelaide. Um, we've got transport. Uh, we, the reason I bring this one up again is also transport issues. Um, we've actually been able to track it around um, Melbourne and Victoria through arborist work, but also soil, soil disturbance work. It was detected in 2014, and it's been causing quite a bit of problems to our um, landscape trees in, in in Melbourne and also in the verges. Uh, we are assessing, we are finding trees are actually dying from the insect now. But generally those trees are dying because they're made more vulnerable by the insect because they are a sap sucking insect. And the secondary infections such as Ipsgranicolis and Cyrex and Diplodia are really killing the trees off because they're weakening their defense mechanisms. 
But what we've found is that, again, arborists doing tree work on the trees that are dying. Also, um, soil disturbance work. We had um, a road, road crew doing a lot of work along trees that were infested. Um, and they moved from one location down to another location to do some more work. But unfortunately, on both locations had pinus and they had dropped off the insect at that location. We can track again the work, work programs and the time that had been infected. And we've also now seen, unfortunately, um, giant pine scale being moved around by birds and wasps and uh, deer and um, possums and all sorts of other insects and, and transmission. And the reason I put that in here is to show that it's not just people, but it's also animals and, and human activity, again, moving them around. So if you hadn't seen what giant pine scale looked like, and yes, it's a main Victorian species, and I know that other people around Australia are on this, on this call, and this is what it looks like. There are one centimetre, they can get up to 1.2 centimetres in length, so that's why they're called giant pine scale. Each uh, insect is a female, and they, when they reproduce, actually all, uh, all the eggs are actually inside them, and when they're ready to hatch, the insects um, pour outside the body, like if, essentially, if you can imagine aliens, they are, the, the body actually explodes, and the insects, the, the little first incisors, which are one millimetre big, actually come out of the insects of the female's body and then start attacking them. Go. That's fine, Peter. So polyphagous shot or borer is uh, the one that I don't know if everyone's heard about yet, but it's certainly something that should be on your radar. It's a beetle that's just been found last in, in August 2021. It hasn't been widely distributed information, which is a bit of a shame, but it, and it will be more and more because now it's been classified as an emergency response and a, a, a threatening species to Australia. But the beetle is highly polyphagous, and what this means is that it will attack a large number of hosts. And the latest da um, data I got sent last week was that they, they can now identify this species on over 700 different species of tree. And this is a really large species of like variability in species. We're talking about trees from um, Japanese maples. We're talking about poplars and solistics, and we're talking about um, uh, all sorts of other um, beetles like um, fig trees, and, and all of them seem to be affected quite heavily. And also, the, they are dying. The beetle carries the fungus fusarium that assists the tree, assists the insect in killing the tree. But we do need to be mindful that there are also what we call reproductive and non-reproductive hosts. This is important because we know that some species will be uh, like mass rearers of the insect and actually help it at distribution, where there are other species which, will, which won't be able to reproduce in, but they'll still feed on and make that, that next jump to the next trees. And at the moment, what's happening is that all the reproductive hosts in, in Perth are being removed to reduce the insect spread. And certainly when I was over there looking at the insect with them, um, it's the, the damage is, is quite severe. Um, the insect galleries in, in amongst the trunk and the, and the rapid decline of branches and, and death of the tree is, is quite phenomenal, to be honest. The spread on, is, is probably, we're, we're probably on a good thing, is that the spread of this insect is quite um, small per year, even though it's, it's quite cryptic to find initially. We're only talking up to probably 100 metres per year from each infested tree because they're such a small insect. These, these little insects are only about a one millimetre, two millimetre size. So spread locally is not, is not long distances like kilometres. But again, we've been worried about um, arb work and inadvertent spread across locations. So this is a, some photographs of it. These are the, the how small they are. You'll see that there's um, this exit uh, holes in the middle here and this white frass which you'll see really evident around the tree you will see this bleeding of the canker or the little canker that the insects being put on this is acacia mercii and you also see this staining under the bark where the where the fungus is actually eating through the tree and if anyone wants any more information on this please reach out and i can send through some more information sheets and, and point you in the right direction but it is been, the, the actual program is being run under the emergency plant response deed so all, all states and territories are coordinating the, the emergency response and helping this WA government remove this, these pests, hopefully from Australia. So what I'd like to go now into is, is potentials. What, what, what are some of the ones overseas that we're really worried about and you guys should be worried about? And each one of these ones that I'll go through, I won't go through that full list that you see on the screen at the moment, but one of the ones I'm gonna talk about are the ones that have actually been detected before it came into Australia.
and also one of the ones some of the ones where really how we do different types of surveillance for it. So Asian longhorn beetle, it's a very large beetle. It goes up to grows up to five centimeters in length. It's a distribution you can see there through China, Japan, Korea, US, Canada, and Europe. And in the US, they've actually been spending a lot of money and a lot of effort trying to get rid of the pest because it's it is again multi uh, multi polyphagous. Uh, it goes across different lots of different hardwood species, and has been causing co substantial decline of the, of their landscape trees in urban landscapes. You see the hole there is quite large. You can fit a whole pencil inside the hole where the exit hole is. But what you need to be mindful of is that the the likely pathway, to, pathway and, and I can say the actual pathway that actually came in in 2014 was through timber packaging and and again um, poor treatment of that packaging coming into Australia. You also see here that the, the uh, symptoms that we're looking for on on material in the trees you'll see these little slits and barks all these little all these little wounds on the side of the bark are actually insect feeding and producing little insect holes where they can lay their eggs. Our concern is when we get it into Australia is that if it spreads around it'll spread around through again more wood wood movement and inadvertent spread through through cutting of branches and, and arb work. And the example is that those 337 containers back in 2014, I think it was 14, came into Australia in, in China, from China in, in, into Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland, WA and South Australia. And within that pallet material, we found four different um, pathogens. Asian longhorn beetle, mulberry beetle, which again actually is bigger than the Asian longhorn beetle, Japanese pine soya and also nematodes. And the reason I put the question mark there is there was a question mark about what species that of nematode that was. There was we, we believe it's a Bursophilenchus, but it wasn't 100 percent confident about which um, which species that is. Luckily they were found early and oh, all just realized that it was must be in the, in the eastern states. It's already on. Oh. Didn't pick up on that. Oops. Hi, Chris, it's David here. I think you're off mic zone. All pellets, luckily all pellets were fumigated and found. Um, and what the um, federal government did is they ran a detection program for over four years. And because we know that just gestation of the insect is up to three to four years and no insects were found. What's determined past that is that since that those detections, the national program has now been run to coordinate a, a trapping program and a, a pheromone program for those insects and those insects are now continuously surveyed and botanical gardens and and local government gar gardens are actually encouraged to be involved with this program setting up traps and looking for the insects and reporting back. Asian gypsy moth um, this is another polyphagous be um, moth it has been detected a numerous times coming into Australia on shipping containers and ship ports. Uh, it was found in, Bris in Brisbane in 2000, <clears throat> in multiple locations, and it seems to be found in Brisbane more likely more than anywhere else because of its pro close proximity to where the, uh, where the imports and the hosts are. But also it's been found even down in the colder climates around Portland in Victoria, or it was actually found on a light tower coming in on a ship. And luckily a vigilant, a vigilant um, biosecurity officer found it on the ship without climbing over the ship and actually were able to treat that um, before it got in. The biggest issue with um, with gypsy moth is that it's uh, highly polyphagous, as I said, but also it, it its um, larvae are quite large, but also its its build up rate is very very high. It's a defoliating pest with extensive home for host range, and the latest data set I've just completed actually for the feds is actually 650 species. Uh, it's also got it's got a th it's a threat to commercial native forest parklands and orchardists and in this scenario, what we're finding is in that 650 species, is that at even some of that's at the genus level and family level. We're finding that pretty much anything that other than grass, will, if it hasn't got anything other host, it will eat. The potential also is about rapid transportation and, and rapid establishment. Um, the, the, when the larvae actually hatch on the shipping container, they actually like laying um, their eggs on hard structures of wood, of like. Uh, when they're actually in the native environment, they lay, lay, lay them on wood and um, high altitude um, rock ledges and that sort of thing, similar to the bogon moth in Australia. And so when they come in, they actually track themselves to the lights around shipping ports. They uh, lay their eggs on the ship on the ships and containers, and then potentially bring them into Australia. So when they hatch, they produce a little, what they call a balloon, 
or a little parachute and they actually can fight the, the silk thread can actually make them be wind blown up to a couple of kilometers and the egg masses are quite hard to find this is what the trapping program in victoria looks like i haven't got unfortunately got any pictures around the other states and territories but it's very very similar um, we have traps all around the different ports around Australia and those little triangle traps is what you see on the right um, have a pheromone in them and those pheromones attract the insects in if they're present. Uh, this is probably more of a Victorian thing but there's also other other states may have some individual um, elmas in the in their population but Dutch elm disease has been a, a, a high risk species to coming into Australia and it's devastated elm populations throughout the world and Australia is one of the last countries left in the world that actually doesn't have Dutch elm disease. New Zealand, unfortunately, um, was that was infected with Dutch elm disease only, I think, 10 years ago. And at the moment, it's being what the classifier is contained in, in New Zealand. But it, it causes a, the, the trees to rapidly die because it blocks the water ca carrying tubes in the tree and prevents water reaching the leaves. And in Australia, in particular Melbourne, as I say, there's, there's estimated around 40,000 elms within parklands, botanical gardens, and as people's backyards, and they really are a threat of this of this pathogen. And and what we do in that scenario across Victoria is that we actually have a a, a national current direct action plan for Dutch elm disease. There's actually a contingency plan for it. So if it, if the pest actually gets found, there's actually a written plan about what the the agency will do and how they do it. And there's also a lot of the councils and botanical gardens are being involved with uptaking this pre-introduction tree maintenance and, and surveys. And you'll see that photograph on the right, the map on the right is, is some of those surveys that we undertake, looking at health of the trees, uh, looking at, we record how many dead branches are in them, potentially what, um, if they're fruit, fruit tree borer, elm bark borer, elm leaf beetle. And what we're trying to do is map those different pests in the elms and look at their health over time. So this is actually one of the largest data sets of tree assessments in Australia. It, it's been running for 26 years now, and we can actually identify every single tree and its health over the last 26 years. And it's been fascinating to work on this data set and look at how um, water and climate and other, other things have been impacting on the health of the trees. But it also has been helping us with tree maintenance. And, and the big thing you can think about with elms is actually making sure your trees are healthy. And this would be by reducing the, the beetle populations. We have the vector of the insect of the pathogen, but we don't have the pathogen. So by reducing the pest population down, it reduces the risk. And to do that, we really need to be able to be removing our dead material and keep it off the trees and doing active pruning, but also and also reducing some root grafting in some locations to try and stop and breaking spread if it happens, but also keeping it vigilant in our in our surveillance. So moving away from a tree one is this brown marmorated stink bug. Uh, everyone's been hearing about um, the federal government at the moment saying that we haven't been able to get our cars out of the port because they're doing, excuse me, biosecurity surveillance. And this is actually primarily because of the primary stink bug and a number of other pests. These uh, have really popped up as being a, a high, high risk to Australia. And myself, in, when I first found, I actually was actually one of the first people in Australia to actually hold brown marmorated stink bugs. Not a very good claim to fame. We actually found a beetle was reported through to, or the bug was reported through to the biosecurity agency uh, from a contractor that was, bringing, that was bringing machinery. And we actually went out there and set up some traps and we we're actually able to capture some of the insects in these traps. And we ran the emergency response and we were able to, we believe we caught, or we hope that we caught all the insects in those traps. And unfortunately there is a, what we call a, be, a brown marmorated stink bug season. And there's a higher risk of imports every year from places like Europe, Italy in particular, and those those levels of detections and surveillance increases. And that's what that season we're actually in at the moment. And that's the reason why the, all these cars and, and shipping containers are being withheld to try and make sure that they um, they get looked at. And we, I know for a fact that there has been some BMSB um, detections of the last over the last month, which is actually what the biosecurity agencies are responding to. What's, in, what's important to understand, you'll see that last point, is that 49 different host plant families, not just species, but families are actually um, susceptible. And you'll see that long list there. So again, it's polyphagous. Yes, it's a bug, it causes some issues, but it's also a problem for our homes. And it's actually worse than cockroaches. It actually, during the winter months, the insect doesn't like the cold. So it actually goes in people's houses and will hibernate there and actually breed up in large numbers it makes and actually makes a very foul smell and I can guarantee that from what I when I picked it up 
And then during summer months, it goes out and then starts um, suck, sap sucking on your fruit and trees and actually causes um, leaf loss and, tr and tree decline. Um, it, it is B BMSB is native to Asia and, and, is, and is found in China, Japan, Taiwan and Korea, but also it's been found in Switzerland and, and a lot of other locations in, in Italy, as I was saying. And it has, it's not just, um, you, it's a very unusual product that it comes in on. Sometimes it's been uh, terracotta pots, it's been uh, tiles for walls, it's been um, uh, shipping containers with very large machinery in it. Um, one of them was actually a, a cat, like a big um, machinery from the US that actually had, uh, it was a dozer actually being brought in for firework that actually had um, BMSB running inside the cab everywhere. And so it was lucky that we were able to find it. The, the person actually describes that he got in the cab to drive it off the truck and he was in, infested, he was, all the insects were running all over him. He jumped out of the truck really quickly. There, there are a large number of native Australian stink bugs, uh, which we don't need to be worried about. But the issue is that they actually do look very similar to Barramarmona stink bugs. So that is an issue for us, that, that detection is, is a problem, but also means that we need to be at a higher, a higher elevation of our thought process about should we be reporting some of these insects? If you see something unusual, should I report it just to be making sure? And it's better to be sending in reports to be, to make sure than not sending in going, I don't think it looks like it. Because it's better to, to, to be unsure and be a negative than it is to be unsure and be positive because we really don't want these establishing. And if any of you guys want these um, slides afterwards, please reach out because it's got links in there that I'll put in there about further work and information you can look up. Uh, Phytophthora morum was another one which will affect multiple different states and territories around Australia. Um, most people would have heard about Phytophthora cinnamomai and, and worried about their soil and the, and the and Phytophthora is moving around their soils. There are a couple, what we're finding is they're actually now airborne Phytophthora and Phytophthora morum is one of those. In Australia, we do know about one, we believe one aerial Phytophthora called Phytophthora felix. And New Zealand has a couple of aerial Phytophthora as well. The issue with Phytophthora morum is yes, it will affect large forest species of trees, um, but it also affects things like rhododendrons. And we know for a fact that rhododendrons in the US, that's the way it moved around the US. Uh, the plant trade, the nursery trade was moving it around inadvertently. Um, and some of the rhododendrons and some of these azaleas and those sort of things that were affected weren't actually showing symptoms. So we can have asymptomatic plants carrying the pathogen and then spreading it around to areas which were symptomatic and then the disease spreading. So just be mindful that, that exotic phytophthora is in summary that exotics, have, that they pose a significant risk to native forest biosecurity urban forests. In the, the issue is it's not always a soil we're worried about and we need to maintain effective barriers to control these exec, um, exotic phytophthora. And you might say, oh, it's really hard to control an airborne phytophthora. That is true, but through monitoring and understanding the risk profile, but also they're not, you're not thinking about long-term spread like kilometers, we're only talking hundreds of meters. But there also needs to be likelihood of, uh, we've got to be careful about these things because they also have the potential for hybrid development within a natural population of Phytophthora. And we want to make sure our nursery practices are in good place. And some of you guys actually may do um, cultivation within your nurseries, not just externally, from um, bringing plants in externally. And also the need to really maintain a capacity for early detection, diagnosis, risk evaluation, to really evaluate an effective response so what we did is in Melbourne's, Melbourne count, uh, Melbourne Royal Botanical Gardens, um, Peter Sines and myself actually set up, and was something we've been developing for a while, is actually a program. We were actually doing an early detection monitoring program. It's something that developed actually with my father. And what we were doing was actually looking at this water supply going into the gardens, water support into the lake system, and actually looking at how we could actually assess the uh, the water moving into the gardens and obviously what was in the lakes at the time. And so we've always done soil sampling with baits and which is a really effective way of doing it, especially with a, a bait called eucalyptus seabori and pears. But we've also been finding that another another host, which is actually, uh, uh, which is Pymelia, which I'm sure Peter jumped on in a second, which he can talk about. But the issue is that what we can do is literally take a water sample out of the sample, out of the water with a, a vial put some of these um, species into the water and then send it off to the laboratory 
and actually get it tested really quickly for Phytophthoras. And we're not just looking for Cinnamoma, which we could pick up. We're also looking for the, what we call a clade sixes, which is our a native. We believe a lot of these are actually native, and you'll see that there's a list of Phytophthoras down here. These are all the different Phytophthoras we found in the Royal Botanical Gardens moving through the waterways. And even though we may not have Remorum or um, Pinifolia or a bunch of other airborne Phytophthoras, if we know what's currently in our waterways, we are then better prepared for something that's not in our waterways. And being and so that early detection monitoring of things that aren't there are really important to know what's currently there. And it was a really simple test. I'll let Peter take over if he wants to have a chat about that as well. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, just to jump in there, I think, um, well, yeah, look, one, of the, one of the lessons here is if you're a botanic garden, you're hooking on a, a, a stormwater harvesting system. You don't have control of the catchment upstream from you. This is a very good way of, of detecting potential um, incursions of Phytophthora and other, you know, it could be other fungi as well. Let's say Phytophthora, which are fungi-like organisms, not fungi themselves. But you could actually screen and affect the catchment upstream of you and check whether you're, you're at risk from the neighbours, if you like. Um, the other thing I just want to mention, this is my really dark, twisted sense of humour using a endangered plant for trapping Phytophthora. So Pomelia trae is actually endangered in Victoria. And interesting enough, the leaves are quite waxy, and I thought, oh, they're not going to pick up any, any Phytophthora at all. You can see the leaves sitting on top of that vial, but actually it was very effective at um, acting as a bait. So you may actually have a rare or threatened plant in your collection that would actually be a really good um, baiting plant. But look, the lesson here is really... Um, not just thinking about your own um, area of management, but thinking about your neighbours and how do you pick up that there might be risks outside your catchment, and particularly if you're hooking up a, a stormwater harvesting scheme where you're effectively mining large areas. Um, you know, if I top for remora was to appear in the domain, um, we may have picked it up like this before we even saw it in the garden. So it would allow a much more rigorous containment program. That's enough from me. Thanks, David. That's okay. And I have to I have to also reiterate, the, the water harvesting thing is a really big issue at the moment because um, we have, we're working with Melbourne City Council, for instance, for the same reason. They're, they're doing a great job of water harvesting all their, their storm water and everything else, and they've got a process in place for their for their uh, treatment of that water. But if you're, mon if you're not monitoring and maintaining that water or if there's something breaks down, you, you won't know what's actually happening. And we do this also with some nurseries as well, um, where they're actually harvesting water out of groundwater or other sources, um, and even out of dams. We're doing testing out of out of, out of these dams out of the out of, for the nurseries, just to make sure they know what they're using, because they may actually recycle that water or use that water out of the dam. So then, because the, the, the issue is, if they actually have a phytophthora in there, and then they start using all their misters, they're volatiling the phytophthora, and it doesn't have to be an airborne phytophthora; it can be any phytophthora into the into the in the rest of their their stock, and then and then also then spreading the phytophthoras around. So it really is important that this this really simple test now that we've developed can actually really help you understand your your risk profile and it may actually be zero which is great a really good outcome and it's quite a cheap test to give yourself some confidence around that so entry and exit of material is something i really wanted to bring forward and it's again something that harps onto the previous work stuff that i talked about but when you bring new plants into your into your gardens what sort of hygiene are you putting imposing uh, are you asking for Niacera accreditation from those from that area? Are you asking the arborists that are coming into your your gardens to be able to do work? Are you making sure that you're meeting best practices for hygiene? Have you cleaned down before you come in? And do you have like a quarantine area? So if you're bringing new plants or material into the into the gardens, have you got a quarantine area that you're isolating those plants in that location for? And this could be for a seven to fourteen day period where you're actually monitoring those closely. And try not to treat them with fungicides during that time because then that because it will affect a mask could mask effect of, of an underlying pathogen. And the main reason I say that is that as part of the myrtle rust plan to maintain or manage myrtle rust in Australia, there's actually a, a, a monitoring or a, a treatment program which most uh, nurseries that are producing Myrtaceae are undertaking. And that does mean that they are they are consistently using or generally consistently using chemicals to maintain or keep their trees or plants healthy. And that's a, and with in symptom development, symptom development for myrtle rust, for instance, is actually seven to fourteen days. So we encourage you at a minimum to keep keep plants isolated for four, for four, seven to fourteen days, and preferably longer than that if you can. And also, if you find if you do find disease material in your or even 
material you think may be diseased within your gardens, make sure you dispose of it appropriately. Don't put it in green waste. It's one of the big ones for um, palm fusarium. We really wanted to make sure that when we're doing the palm work that we normally just chip the, chip the palm leaves and throw them back out in the gardens. Just It was just asking for a, for a problem because it's a soil borne disease and it will live on the plant mature for a long period of time. Make sure that you are putting it in hard waste and making sure it's, it's buried appropriately. And an example of this is, uh, again, Pete can jump on in a second, but um, this is a detection we had in the Royal Botanical Gardens. This is, uh, we actually found the Plodia africana, which is an exotic um, pathogen. And since we found it in the Royal Botanical Gardens in Melbourne, we also have found it in Perth as well. And this tree was actually removed under biosecurity best practice. And you'll see there in the bottom right hand bottom right hand corner that where we're actually set up, we had hygiene baths, we had um, full hygiene scenarios. We we're actually going through and cleaning everything. And you'll see the big skip behind it where we actually took the skip to the site. Uh, we actually was filling up the back of the trucks, all covered trucks to be able to get rid of the pest. And also we actually had it all, all um, disinfected as we're going through. Pete, do you want to add some extra to that? Yeah, I'll jump in. Um... I think what the, the point here, um, you know, we lost the tree and thankfully we didn't have to remove more, but this uh, this bishop's pond, a finest miracard, is actually vulnerable um, in its native habitat and actually endangered in Mexico where it occurs. This was the only specimen in the garden, so we effectively lost a tree that could have actually had high conservation potential, but had to be removed because this was an exotic um, exotic fungus that we didn't know a lot about. There was concerns it could be worse than some of the the others that already exist, like the Plodia pinea. So that was that was a real you know, loss for the gardens. Um, fire blight was a similar event for us in Melbourne, or when I was in Melbourne, I should say. Um, as part of that containment, we actually had to remove and destroy uh, wild collected plants from China that were, a lot of them were rare or unusual, but because they were so susceptible, um, you know, the rules of containment override. So for you as a botanic garden, it may be, it's more than just a nuisance. You actually may lose really valuable plants uh, because of an incursion. So, you know, the cost of them, you can't, a lot of these plants are replaceable. You can't replace them. You might even be able to obtain them again. So that's something to think about. The other thing with this um, incident was interesting because we had to try and contain all the sawdust and all the material. Normally you would put black plastic down, but black plastic's very slippery. So I think we end up using um, weed mesh as a as an alternative, and you know this was all done in house. Everyone was all suited up and bagged up. But sometimes you're, um, it's useful to think about your containment practice, what you might do, because there's it does bring in um, safety issues. So you need to contain the contain the material, but you can't have your arbors flipping over on the plastic and falling on, a, say, a running chainsaw, for example. So. Sometimes there's practical considerations where you're trying to draw a compromise between containment and safety. But I have to give credit to David um, and the department. They worked very closely. They kept this quite um, quiet and wanted to determine whether it was a, a major issue. So I think, I suppose the other lesson out of this for me is work really closely with your local biosecurity agents, develop really strong relationships because they're actually not your enemy. Um, we're all trying to do the same thing. So I think. What I got out of this um, this case study was the real benefit of strong relationships and working together. Thanks, David. That's okay. And as Peter alluded to, that when we actually did a lot of work on this really quickly. We, we didn't know anything about Diplodia africana and Diplodia pioneer, which people may have heard of, which also causes quite a large sniffing at dieback to pines. What we did is we put that into the laboratory really quickly and, and actually pulled out, we actually infected uh, young pines to see if there's what lesions development was and the, the speed of uh, development of the pathogen in trees to try and work out if it was worse than the one we already have. And thankfully, this was one of the pathogens that was actually not as significant as the one we already have. But we want we wanted to make sure that we removed these trees um, and make sure that we didn't put any selection pressure on developing a higher higher breed of this pathogen. But another way that you guys can get involved is all about what we classify as sentinel plant tree plantings. Your, your gardens have a large variety of trees and plants in them. And so they can be really important about this early warning detection system. And there's a lot of work at the moment with other colleagues that I have that were about this pre-border surveillance. And we're actually looking, getting people involved with looking in their gardens overseas for our, some of our species. 
um, but also they're asking for us to look at some of their species. So this monitoring species, tree species of unknown susceptibility overseas in areas where exotic pests or pathogen may occur. And we've actually done this with some trapping programs as well. We've actually done some pheromone traps. We actually send over what we want to look for and how we might be able to find these insects better than, so we're prepared for them in Australia. But also we also want to look at Australian native species and which are also extensively planted overseas and what they might be of risk. And we might actually then do some risk profiling about what that risk is back to Australia. And we've certainly got that some of that work we've been doing for myrtle rust when we myrtle rust people may know is actually being used in the Everglades in uh, Florida to actually as a biocontrol to kill Mutasi. And so what but because we knew that was happening, we were able to catch ba touch base with that. Um, that group and then look at other species that they may have seen it being affected. But the most important one for you guys is really the, the post-border surveillance, this early detection system around our high-risk sites. And, each, and unfortunately, being a botanic gardens means you most likely are a high-risk site. You have a high visitation number, you have people coming from all over the world, potentially coming to your gardens, but not only even across the world, people, they're just plant people. They love going through gardens. They'll be in Melbourne one day and then the next time they're over in Adelaide or next or any, anywhere, they'll be flying out to go and have a look at the next gardens, go across to Kings Park in WA. The issue around it is that are we, are we really looking enough? Are we doing enough surveillance? Are we knowing what we should be looking for? Are we trained enough to actually know those symptoms? And so that's the, the big one that I'm really interested in developing up as a, as a scientist and, and researcher at the, at the University of Melbourne, also where I'm Albert Carbon, is this understanding susceptibility. Are we looking at our new tree planting susceptibility as we're putting them in? Uh, are we understanding that those risks as we're putting those trees in and what we should be looking for? And <clears throat> making sure that we have up to date GIS or tree data of each one of our trees we're putting in the ground so we have a full list of everything. And then we can actually do risk modelling. And so this is what some of the research I've just been doing. It's just been going on for now about nearly 12 years, but there's this last bit of work I've just finished off actually last week with the city of Melbourne. Um, we were actually, I proposed that we actually looked at 65 exotics and endemic pests um, in Australia that were coming to Australia or already are in Australia. And what might impact the tree database of, or tree impact the Tree Urban Landscape and Melbourne Council. So as I was doing this 65 pest host list, so I found over 4,000 host species for those 65 pests. It took me a while, so it took me about three months to find all those hosts, looking through literature and we got grey literature and people's databases of those, of those 65 pests. And what I've been able to do is create a database now that we can now link to pest lists of other, of other places. So for Melbourne, we're able to use their georeference database and link this this list to their database and then be able to produce a spatially understanding of where if a pest comes in, this is actually for Dutch elm disease, where all our Dutch elms are or elms are that might be affected by Dutch elm disease. And this work is still being currently, and I'm still writing the report on this, but I'm giving you guys a bit of a, an early insight into some of the research that we're just about to present, or we have presented yes on Monday. And just some other examples that variability of the different pests affects the variability of different where the different species are within the landscape. So for Asian longhorn beetles, got a, as I said, it was holly polyphagus, so it'll affect a lot more species, whereas monocamus is more a pine species, but not all pine. So it will affect a smaller number of species. So for you guys as a, as an, as a, a park, a botanical park group, you might have a small number of species. You could run this analysis essentially and then work out, okay, well, I've got these number of trees that might be affected. These are our host populations and actually understand that risk profiling. And also some other research we're doing in my in Arbor Carbon is this remote sensing work. So the other half, the, the, our team actually does a lot of remote sensing. Um, we do high resolution imagery down to one centimetre if we need it. And this um, resolution inf information we're doing at the moment, we're working with New South Wales on, on uh, what we call early learning or deep learning scenarios. And we're able to fly across urban landscapes now. We're able to pinpoint every single tree we're able to give you a health rating. We're actually able to do uh, species recognition, heights, and the whole range of other metrics. And, but in the biosecurity scenario, what we're doing is going to be working with, Mel we're hoping to do some work in, in Melbourne. On this is what we're going to do is actually look at our risk profiling for the pest list, look at our tree databases and our remote sensing, and actually be able to produce like essentially a traffic light system that gives us our, where our trees are that have got symptoms, symptom development or of a different pest because we can actually pick out the number of dead branches within trees now and tell you and actually look at time series and look at crown dynamics and crown loss. So this is a really exciting part of the of the new step forward in in, bi in biosecurity and, and early surveillance.
But in conclusion, you've heard I've spoken way too long and I'll need to get back to questions, but prote protection of our valuable botanical gardens is really a shared responsibility and of you guys as dedicated staff at the gardens, but also the governments, the state, local and, and uh, federal governments, and industry and also the general public. The increased number of pest interceptions every year and we end with the increased trade is it really highlights the need for continued vigilance and support supported by tree management agencies, tree industry and general public to detect those that may escape detection and border entry. And that's where I find you guys are the most important. You guys know your trees intimately. You know why what, something that goes off. I get phone calls from um, garden staff in Victoria all the time. Oh, we've got a tree that's died off. Oh, we've just seen a, a die back of branch. Can you have a look? And it's really, it's really that relationship with your your biosecurity agencies or your pet or your forest pathologists, entomologists in local agency or your local area. It really will give you a strength in, the, in understanding what's going wrong with your trees. And if you want, and, and you might be, you might be able to supply those tree databases by local councils to, to to the biosecurity agencies responsible for the surveillance to to help them with that scenario, those pest surveillance. But really, in conclusion, really is what we really want to press with you guys is that maintenance. Protection of Australia is really down to everybody's responsibility. We need to be out of maintenance of high efficient quarantine barriers. That's the federal government's role, but we need to be able to set up high hazard site surveillance around ports and high risk sites. But we also need to have health surveillance in your gardens. And if you if, if you think you see something, report it. That's the really take home message. If you don't understand something, there are now ways to report that. And one of the best ways at the moment is actually with this My Pest Guide Reporter, is My Pest Reporter. I would encourage you to download this. It says WA. But it's actually been in but it's actually now all states and territories have signed up to that pest reporter you'll find it in the app stores and you can essentially go in there take a photo of your pest of or your problem or your pest and actually send it through to the app through the app and it goes whatever state and territory you're in it'll automatically go to your biosecurity agency for a response the other way to do it is also through the 1800 number or if you're in victoria you can actually go to the the link here provided which will send it through to the biosecurity agency directly but i would encourage you to really to get involved with biosecurity and also look at your trees and, and report things that are unusual. That's how we find so many different things. And I encourage you to really learn. And it's also a way of you learning what's normal, what's abnormal in your in your parks and gardens. So thanks for letting me speak today and I really appreciate it. And if you have any other if you have any questions, please don't hesitate. Thanks, um, David. Um, I just wanted to ask you a quick question on the um, shot hole borer. Just, yep. um, I don't know, you might have mentioned it, but how did it um, arrive in Australia? And is it mainly on the older trees or is it newer plantings as well that it affects? They don't know how it actually got here. That's one thing they still haven't been able to determine. But it's, it is affecting all, all size and age of tree down to around the five centimetre diameter. So it is a real concern that even new plantings, it, it's, the, the, what's the limiting factor? What, the limiting factor is actually the size of the insect and if it can produce a gallery. So if, it, if, they got a, if you've got a, a tree that's two, three, four centimetres diameter, it will, if it can produce a gallery in the tree and the insects are only one, one millimetre big, then they can produce, they can actively go through the tree and reproduce. Thanks. That's okay. Right. Did anyone else have any questions? Just pop your hand up if if you like, um, or pop it in the chat if you, if you want. Um, but that was a great presentation. Thanks, David. And lots of um, information too to take in. And um, I think here at Geelong, you know, we definitely um, we're working towards our you know better hygiene standards and quarantine areas. And um, it was great with what Peter said as well about looking around you as well. Um, We've got, um, you know, all our street trees in Geelong and um, I suppose sometimes you forget we're sort of fenced in, but yeah, there's definitely a lot of um, pests that could um, transfer in here from from close by. Yeah, well, certainly for Palm Fusarium, what we found in Geelong right at the start yeah. as well. We yeah. luckily eradicated it, but but it's always on our pest rate register that we need to be keep a, a vigilant in that, in that scenario. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. And um, yeah, so thank you for coming along and speaking for us today. I'll, uh, the meeting's recorded, so I'll share as well. And maybe it, is it okay to share your slides with everyone as well when that comes through? Yep. No I problems at all. Yeah. I think I've freaked everyone out and they're all scared yeah. to say hi now. Yeah. <laughs>
No, all good. Um, and yeah, you did say if you've got any questions, they might be able to um, email you um, later or just email me as well and I can pass it on to David. Yeah, that's big fine. No problems at all. I think Brandon just put a, a question in the chat. Yeah, okay. I'd, I'd have to look that up, Brandon. I'm not a, I'm not a big Vitus person, I apologise, but I can certainly have a look for you and get back to you if you like. Yep, no, that'd be fantastic. If you just want to send me an email, I'll um I can have a look for it and see what yep. I can find for you. Oh, awesome. Are you able to put your email maybe in the chat, David? I quickly? can, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I don't know what the Uh, yeah, yeah. More, more than happy to, to support anyone that needs a bit of, needs some support in their gardens. Three for about 600 emails now, though. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> I don't mind. The, the, being in more more engaged community is the best way of being informed and understand what's going on. So that's the whole thing about it. And I think that's a really great group you have here, Cherie, that you can have be this engaged and also have that information, being able to share it with everyone and everyone's working on the same page and with, yeah. with the same goal in mind. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. Yeah, excellent. Okay, well, um, I'll, yeah, we'll leave it there. And um, yeah, thanks very much uh, again for coming along and thanks everyone for um, coming along as well. So we'll see you. I think that our next one's on the 10th of May. So we hopefully we'll see everyone then. So, thank you. Thanks, David. Uh, no worries. Thanks, Peter. Um, sorry, yeah, thanks. Sorry.